Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achand. There's one thing that the that anybody can say for sure about China today is that the Chinese are weakening economically, but that is the baseline of pretty much everything. Their diplomatic efforts have been failing. Their political push-arounds around the world, especially with Russia, Ukraine, and many other places, you've seen a kind of a setback. They're not even getting a headway with India, which they thought would be an easy game to play. Let's discuss this. What is going to be the geopolitic, uh, geopolitics of a weakening China? Where does China see itself going now that things are taking a realistic sort of a curve for China? And will it get more docile, friendly, or will it remain a stickler to its own principles or the Xi Jinping thought? Let's discuss with Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, who's uh, joined here once again on Dev Talk. Sir, thank you so much for joining me once again. Good evening and welcome to the show. Thank you, Ali. Great pleasure to be back. Sir, one thing that is, can be acknowledged today and can be acknowledged with Chinese characteristics, if I may, and the pun is absolutely intended, uh, is that the China setup, the China system is kind of taking a jolt. There's, there's a bit much of weakening in all directions which is happening and the worst part about the whole thing is previously when this weakening used to happen it used to be covered and it used to be very well managed by the Chinese today it's not so how do you see this situation for the Chinese themselves so you know Ali when I got your message um, which was basically what you said that we'll discuss whether China is weakening so I've, uh, you know, thought about it, done my own reading. So what I will do, I will tell you a whole lot of uh, things or reasons which tell us uh, that China is not in a good position. And I will also highlight two to three contrarian views which tell you that China is not all that bad. And then uh, we can decide <laughs> precisely as to how China is trending. See why it is very important for us. You look at the Americans. Even if they get into a conflict with China, it's an away game. It's mm -hmm. thousands of kilometers away from their coastline. So, you know, they look at China from this balance of power perspective. And which is basically what? That America must have the freedom to roam the globe. There should be no regional hegemon. So, across this Eurasian uh, pipeline, they don't want Russia to become as powerful as Germany because then if it becomes the dominant player in Europe, it threatens America, World War II, and they don't want a regional hegemon to emerge in the Indo-Pacific, which is China. So that's their game. But for India, it is our neighbor. It is right on our borders. So it has uh, far graver consequences. So while we must not either underplay the threat, we must not overplay the threat, we must get it right. Because if we do not get Chinese you know, geopolitics right, they will have great consequences for our national security. And it's not easy to get a country like China right. So we must make a determined attempt. You know, Biden may well be right in his very folksy ways when he says, that China is a ticking time bomb. He's pointing to their economy and there are a host of factors which suggest that. And many also says, you know, that when bad folks are in trouble, they do bad things, which is again a way of saying that, uh, and he must be having uh, some American intelligence on it, that if the Chinese economy is in trouble, Taiwan is going to happen. So uh, you just see uh, CIA director Burns says that Taiwan is neither imminent nor inevitable. But Li Shangfu in Moscow said that Taiwan is inevitable. The forceful reunification will happen. So these are definitely, what shall we say, exciting times or dangerous times. Uh, Z has been pr preparing the PLA greatly. He <laughs> has been talking of... Um, you know, being 1,000% ready for Taiwan. He has been visiting Eastern Theater Command every three to four months. They did a 
uh, war game in this Thangshan Harbor, which is closest to the, you know, what shall I say, operational configuration of the Taiwanese Tamsui Harbor, I think some months back. And the conclusion was that the PLA is not in a position to exercise sea or air control. Not in a position. Some say all that which is happening in the rocket force is because the rocket force was not confident. And it, it annoyed uh, uh, Xi greatly. There is the present vice chairman of the um, uh, Chinese uh, Central Military Commission. I will have to refer to this to give you his name. Uh, General Zhang Zuzia. Zhang Zuzia. He and a couple of others are of the view that this is a receding opportunity because, as you said, with all the Chinese going, the Chinese going loud and proud, there is a huge pushback. Their economy is declining. There is this whole technological caging uh, of, of China by the USA. The USA is, is, is stepping up its war preparations. So they are talking of a receding strategic uh, opportunity. They do it now. I'm told many of the rocket force generals were of the other view. There is another very respected Chinese general, and I will have to refer to this just to give you his name because these names are very unpronounceable. Uh, general Liu Yazao. He is the former political commissar of the Chinese NDU and a very respected Chinese uh, scholar. Uh, he is of the view that, you know, the PLA is not operationally uh, ready. He's of the view he's not operational ready, not operational ready, and he's been charged with some kind of treason for saying that. So there are sharp divisions within the PLA. Uh, Z really does not, uh, you know, is 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 uh, caught in a quandary. So these, uh, he himself has said, you know, he's told the PLA that it's not just uh, the high winds, but the dangerous storms that you have to be prepared for, which is Taiwan. We know that. So a lot is happening. Of course, Xi is worried. I would say that his cup of woes are rather full. These are not uh, good times for China, but we have to take a cool, calm, uh, and a wise view on China. And what does it mean? We must stand up to the Chinese hardball. I'm a big proponent of that. But we must not do it in a jingoistic manner. It must be cool, calm. Because China is a crafty customer and we have to really, you know, get it right. So, you know, my opening premise is this, that China is weakening. There is a great deal to worry about. Uh, and we will go on to discuss uh, what, uh, what we should do. But the view must be balanced. And equally, we must on be honest and look inwards. What are we doing to uh, tackle the Chinese challenge? Are we doing enough? You see today, what is the debate? Today, the European CNC of the European C, uh, the CNC of the European Command, American European Command, he was hauled up before the Congress and people said that you don't uh, tell me why Putin attacked. You tell me why did your deterrence fail? You see, these are the questions that will get asked. So we must be extremely sure of what is happening and we must not sleepwalk into conflict. We must, uh, I mean, declining conflict is also an option, having seized your adversary carefully. So that's your my opening premise. And uh, now we can, you know, go on to the other issues, if that is okay with you. Some details about the Absolutely, economy. Sir. Let's okay. do that. So let's see, you know, some uh, very bad pointers as to where the Chinese economy is. The Chinese economic growth, so may I just make one or two uh, larger point before I get to that? You know, there is the economic worries and we'll just come to the nitty gritty. Look at these spy wars. What has happened in the rocket force and before that, there is a whole HR crisis doing in the strategic uh, Chinese strategic military establishment, which is worrying uh, Z greatly. About a month or two ago, Wang Shou Jun, the director of the Central Security Bureau in the CCP, which is somebody who is responsible for Z's personal security and spying on his rivals, dies mysteriously. A couple of weeks later, 
there's a gentleman called Feng Yang He. He was supposed to be the PLA's AI biscuit, somebody like Eric Skimmit, who's leading the American Renaissance in AI in the American military. He, and you know, he was uh, behind the designing of the much touted Chinese Battle Command Network. He died in a car accident. Now, in China, car accidents can happen accidentally and not so accidentally. So, At two o'clock in the morning, sir, when he was driving something, alone. Something like that. So, some question marks. Look at this now. The rocket force is stunning. Rocket force are all appointees of G. So it is his appointees, his proteges who are going disloyal. I am told Liu Chao, uh, his son was studying in the US and some secrets got passed on. And why the foreign minister King John was sacked was because when he got to know of it, he delayed reporting it to Xi under the influence of that TV hostess Fu. So I'm told that's the linkage. So it's, and I think it is the American intelligence back at work. You see, the Americans have been on the back foot for a long time with the MSS and so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, they really got fooled by this whole Chinese charade of a peaceful rise, which was very artfully done. And we'll spend some minutes on that. Uh, so that, you know, the Americans are really riled that their whole intelligence establishment had been taken for a ride. I suspect they have got back and they have engineered this hey, huge informational compromise. Now, please forget, don't forget, it is not the, an informational co compromise of merely uh, the rocket force, which is, you know, uh, this long range ecosystem. It is a compromise in the nuclear deterrent of a 21st century superpower. Let, let, let's let that sink in. The nuclear deterrent of a 21st century superpower, which is no longer NFU, but increasingly moving towards launch and warning. She says, I can't trust these guys with secrets. How can I trust them with a nuclear arsenal? And therefore, this whole purge, I'm told, 10, 10 generals have been rounded up. The previous foreign minister, if I'm not wrong, Wang He, the first rocket force commander to be made defense minister. And see, Xi really put his personal capital into it. It was nobody from the army. Uh, it was uh, uh, He was a scientist. Uh, look at the present defense minister, Li Shang Fu. He has been deputy commander of rocket force and he's commanded a satellite center. It's like me in the army commanding a rocket force and also ISRO center. You know, something like that. This is the kind of faith and trust he put in these rocket force generals. And you go and let him down. No wonder he's brought a rank outsider who has not served one day in the rocket force. That's a naval admiral. It is a very serious issue of informational compromise, disloyalty. And last month he chaired a CMC meeting in July, in July, where he warned these generals that he will unearth corruption scandals going 10 years back. And he said that, uh, you know, you must have your own integrity mechanisms to discover these issues before I discover them. So it is a very serious crisis. Link it with the larger war weariness. I spoke of uh, that gentleman, um, Liu Yaozu, quite a titan who's telling the Vice President in the CMC that we are not ready. So there is talk of a receding strategic opportunity. One faction saying we are not ready. And see, when militaries come closer to combat, the real problems start because you keep you get, get the jitters. Now, let me make a larger point to you. You see, China may be beginning to realize that pretentiousness to power is one thing. You know, economy working well, TikTok doing well. Uh, that guy, uh, Jack Ma, Alibaba, all that stuff. But listen, when it comes to applying military muscle, there are grave consequences. So the pursuit of real powerhood is quite another ball game, And Taiwan will be the first test. So the military burdens of power are a costly gamble, sometimes sustain unsustainable. So when Z comes closer to Taiwan, he, his generals, and I think everybody in China is getting the jitters. Uh, so 
this is the uh, the other issue you know so these uh, william burns by the way gets elevated to cabinet rank is he being rewarded for work, work well done so it's not only technological wars it is spy wars informational compromise a crisis of confidence in the pla so these are just put yourself you know you are at the head of a um, you are a one man head of a nation of 140 crores it's not even a collective any longer it is now g not g and means many others it is just g and if things are not going quite right uh, what does it do to your image if all this were not enough look at the economy now i'm told china's economic growth has fallen behind rest, the rest of asia for the first time since the 1990s first time since 1990s the chinese dgp gdp growth which was for the last 10 years has not been that spectacular 10 percent it has been declining it has declined consistently except for a brief respite in 2021 so this is not the china of 10 percent growth it is the china of three to four percent growth aging demographics technological caging sanctions the chips act global inflation global inflation means that people elsewhere uh, do not have the money to buy chinese goods so reduce demands for chinese goods now there are all kinds of theories if you go into chinese social media they say that they have faked their economy it's not 18 trillion dollars it's only 9 trillion dollars paul martinez a professor in the University of Chicago trots out a whole lot of economic indicators to tell you that their economy may not even be $9 trillion, it is $5 trillion. So God knows what the truth is, but see some very visible signs. Look at what is happening the world over. The government pumps money, the economy responds, demand recovers, and the you know economy gets going again. Here the Chinese government is pumping money, there is no demand. There is no demand, there is no economic activity, so you are trending towards zero inflation. Is China heading for recession? And the larger issue is that there has been a loss of global confidence in China's you know, post-pandemic uh, pandemic recovery. I was uh, just watching a program by Kyle Bass. I think he's an Australian journalist. He is warning Westerners to stop visiting Shanghai and China. He's saying there are very active war preparations on the eastern coastlines. You know, things like stocking grains, stocking your energy reserves, public mobilizations, getting public canteens going, all wartime mobilization activity. He is warning Westerners to get out of China. Westerners to leave China. So all these are, you know, hugely worrying signs. Let's also look at some of the mistakes perhaps he made. When he got after Jack Ma, it's sometimes not understood that Jack Ma was a rock star in China. He, people say, combined Elon Musk and Bill Gates. He was this very poor peasant son who rose to fame just on the basis of merit. And when he got so powerful, people say he became the foreign minister of China. The Chinese people would believe him when he pronounced on various issues more than the Chinese foreign minister. He threatened the Chinese Communist Party. He so monopolized business there, see the internet, economy, transportation, insurance, taxis, banking, everything was Alibaba. Because he began to challenge the CCP, he was reined in. Now, when you rein in Jack Ma, it is like the Americans coming down heavily on Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. What is it going to do to business confidence? Though the you know CCP argues it out, you know that it was in the interest of fair market competition, there was no consumer choice. But this reining in of the private sector is actually a big issue. I have also read, you know, uh, reports to suggest that many of the Chinese ideologues and the elite told Xi that, listen, enough of wealth. The time has come to convert this wealth into power. Let wealth be for a while, get Taiwan back. So there are those pressures, the historical reunifications. 
we know how zero covid ground the economy to a halt i'm told in shanghai i don't know if it's an exaggeration 40 to 50 percent of people are under depression they were locked up so for so long now you know giving an allowance for social media exaggerations i don't know but these are the figures i have read unemployment the last released figures was 20.8 percent once they've stopped releasing them i'm told actual employment is between 40 to 50 percent so i mean if you want to see how badly the chinese economy has done i could simply go on no domestic consumption uh, the usa's economic containment seems to be working you see when you ban 5g there is no business for huawei the apps are not doing well in the west all this there is capital flight the exit of high net worth individuals so yes sub jo hai the look at the yuan it is now trending 7.31 yuan to a dollar real estate is a very significant uh, factor because real estate i'm told uh, accounts for one third of the chinese economy so first you had trouble in evergrande then there's a company called company garden it had trouble company garden the sales uh, are down by 78 percent a third company sino ocean the sales are down by 72 percent now three companies in succession this last name company couldn't produce 20 million dollars to repay its interests now a real estate crisis people say it would lead to insurance crisis loss of public confidence panic and financial meltdown now, when it melts down, if the Chinese economy melts down, either China hunkers down, what it always done in a crisis, the Great Wall, bring everything down, or to distract, it does Taiwan. Now, it is very difficult to say which of the two may happen, but uh, something is seriously amiss. Now, this is, uh, you know, one view. It is also given by the fact that, you know, perhaps there are critics within China that Z went loud and proud prematurely. It's too much of aggressiveness has led to a pushback. He has launched a charm offensive. You see the exchanges he's had with leaders of Vietnam, Brazil, France, Germany, European Union. Uh, so he's trying to recover ground. Uh, but, I mean, the one very clear view is that things are not well in china i'm told currently the chinese politburo is meeting in Baidadhe or however you pronounce it that Baidadhe. place where they have uh, they have a summer summit and some of the leaks of the spirit or the minutes of that meeting are that they are saying clean out u.s companies from china especially in agriculture finance and services so things may be getting work worse there is talk of developing the nuclear deterrent further spending more than 4% of GDP on defense, create global alliances to counter U.S. hegemony. Li Xiongfu's visit in the security summit in Moscow. Thereafter, he travels to Belarus, uh, promote self-sufficiency, raise energy stocks, raise food grain stocks. So all these are extremely worrying signs. And I told you all that's happening along the, you know, the eastern coastline. Along with this, we've seen, you know, many initiatives of reshoring from the West, of balancing supply chains. So this whole Chinese dream, this great Chinese business uh, success seems to be in great trouble. now. Or at least it's in, it's in considerable turmoil. So this is, you know, one view, spy wars. I've told you about informational compromise. Uh, the strategic military indicators not being too good. This is one view of China. If you have any comments on that, fine. And thereafter, we can discuss the other view on China, which is to say things are not too bad. So let's, we could do both. Sir, I mean, uh, my main contention, which comes out, and you, you've brought out something very interesting about the armed forces. And I've been kind of pondering upon this. You know, you become a colonel in the Chinese army, you become a senior colonel in the Chinese army, and then you know you're going to become a major general. Now, when I know, yeah, major general, ban ke to my, my bloody head will be knocked off. 
if i don't follow the line who would want to become a major general in the chinese army what would be the motivation for some guy to grow up and do stuff if it's not money if it is money then he gets stuck so how, how do you kind of link the whole thing and what kind of a drawdown effect does it have when you kind of start taking out people as you say very close to combat you see the pla there are two three ways of looking at the pla so one is that you know its transformation has been really <clears throat> there was a time when the chinese couldn't fly a plane over taiwan the taiwan strait wahan se abhi ye aa gaye hain where the americans are keeping out of the first island chain second island chain so there has been a huge transformation that transformation has been nursed by ji himself and we have spoken about it in earlier episodes what happened in the first purge was he took care largely of the army and the empires that had been built you know in their fixed commands so he changed them to theaters gave a greater role to the air force and the navy that lot had been taken care of what happened in the rocket force since they were more technical they were not the shall we say the regular pla isme wo jo princeling wala factor tha that was retained and he didn't touch them for a while he also they also gained their confidence but now look at this this is what is most worrying and i will reiterate this the others were proteges of our earlier generation jiang zemin and all that hu jintao the current crop was his own appointees and if his own appointees are not loyal to him imagine the fears that he has about the rest of the pla is he asking for too much sir no see that is the whole issue uh one is that Uh, you know they have got carried away by the lure of money and sleaze if that is so that is a lesser that should be a lesser worry for pla because you can always replace them but if all this is a consequence of bad choices and incompetence so when you are close to executing your operational mission you are developing some kind of war weariness and now you are distracted by other things if it points to incompetence we should be happy and he should be very worried so you know uh, now so now this is a good way to analyze the pla see one is dreaming big being ambitious and bold there they are doing very well but wo sab prove hoga on ground and unfortunately in military matter you can't say it till the army starts fighting look at the russians they were the second largest military big uh, leverage leverages of the gerasimov doctrine and how everything was undone in the first phase and the second phase all of ukraine's uh, honor and uh, valor is of proving to be of no use because of western hesitancies in supplying armor uh, in supplying weaponry and technology so things fluctuate both ways and they move pretty fast so the final delivery of an army is a is a you know collaboration or an aggregation of hundreds of factors now let's take the rocket force i have done some very serious study on the rocket force i have also written an article and what amazes me about this rocket force is a very interesting story look at you know, some things we should emulate and some things we should be wary of the chinese watch this ricky strike complex which succeeded you know of the americans in gulf war 1 and 2 so they see these sensors they see how this information is converted into targeting data and through the use of smart munitions not tonnage so sensors accurate targeting through smart munitions they are game changers in in warfare what the americans call the ricky strike complex so the chinese watch it and scale it up by an order of magnitude they say we will take sensors from eight domains land sea air subsea seabed space em cyber and none of this is english 
space em cyber is exactly what the strategic support force is strategic support force is the digital frame for the rocket force the non kinetic cover for the rocket force it rides on clouds ai so on and so forth they develop what is called the spectrum warfare what is spectrum warfare jo basic recce rs recce strike complex ki theory thi firstly you take it across domains eight domains and they don't leave it at that look at their space the orbital presence of the pla has increased by 359% since 2015 the americans say that you know in missile testing ballistic missiles i think since 2021 the chinese have tested 135 ballistic missiles more than all the countries of the world put together the americans say that the testing infra is better than the the chinese infra is better than the americans so this rocket force which is you know that has this great magazine depth from taiwan to heartland usa hypersonic ballistic and cruise people say it is the most modern missile system in the world the americans are seriously worried they are rejigging their whole apparatus ages hard the um, patriots dispersing b52 bombers to australia moving out of the first and second island chain so what the rocket force has done is that it has threatened american force projection in the western pacific it is a major change it also puts into question the americans ability to come to the aid of their or meet their treaty obligations japan and korea i think today a summit is beginning in camp david biden the south korean president and the japanese uh, prime minister and they are working on what to do about missile defense how to take on the chinese the uss kentucky is somewhere around the korean peninsula their uh, nuclear enabled um, sea platform there are massive exercises going in there two you see virtual axes have emerged china north korea russia versus japan south korea and usa they are going to fight it out on the first island chain and second island chain philippines the americans are doing massive basing guam which is the forward the static aircraft carrier the forward command center of the ipacom is going through a billion dollar missile upgrade the professional conclusion is that if the chinese fire these missiles they will saturate the american air defense system and penetrate तो एक तो ये कहानी है सो दिस पोटेंशियली वेरी पोटेंट इंस्ट्रूमेंट इफ इट हैज दीज फेक जनरल्स तब तो वो गया सो यू नो यू यू रियली डोंट नो व्हाट इज इट इट इज अ पोटेंट इंस्ट्रूमेंट दे हैव इन्वेस्टेड इन टेक्नोलॉजिकली दे हैव इन्वेस्टेड बाय वे ऑफ फाइनेंस दे आर थ्रेटनिंग द अमेरिकंस but uh, if this is the state of the hr the raja see generalship is extremely important they extremely important in china which the, a system where you don't allow generalship to grow where you treat your generals like corporals you will get the statesmanship of corporals so these are some of the questions you know which will always remain unanswered till things actually happen in india what we must do is see what is the capacity and build for that capacity for example the rocket force should uh galvanize us to do far more in terms of missile defense in terms of creating our own uh, rocket force so just as the americans are doing so much why are they doing so much if the rocket force if the chinese rocket force was not something to 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 bother about so this is what my assessment is if things are going wrong in the hr apparatus so much so uh, very good for us but the other investments that they are doing you know in missilery in precisionary investments in space cyber these are what is some their uh, ssf which riding on military clouds ai see how worried the americans are Craig Martel the AI advisor to the SecDef has launched what is called Task Force Lima 
what is task force lima driving the power of generative ai through pentagon should the indian military not be doing a similar thing i mean ai is not nation agnostic now these are the steps we should take uh the chinese military has invoked their leverage of ai and all has forced centcom centcom to appoint an ai advisor who is the ai advisor jo dr john moore who's dr john moore is the vp of ai google cloud should our northern theater eastern theater not been doing similar things isme koi sequential baat hi nahi hai so these are some of the issues you know which we must uh, <coughs> we must do when we take stock realistically of the chinese so as i began by saying it shouldn't worry us there is no panic but we should not neither exaggerate nor underplay carry out a balanced assessment of the threat and respond with speed and and, and scale that is absolutely insightful so let's let's listen to the contrarian view because you know i'm i'm quite curious contrarian i'll tell you where i get the contrarian view there's a very interesting guy you must listen to him george yo mm. he was the <laughs> chief of their air force uh, a diplomat 30 years now he gives a very convincing contrarian view you may agree disagree with it apart from other people like kishore mehbubani who say and we must listen to this who say that the west doesn't understand china you know you you uses these phrases he says let's not dismiss china in these stock phrases autocracy authoritarian state um they don't understand democracy he says china is a 600000 6000 year civilization he gave a very interesting statistic he says china has had 23 dynasties the histories of these dynasties have been carefully written and recorded in beijing bookstores you get these histories with the annotations of mao and the annotations on mao's annotations now if any of this is true it is how seriously they study history they made use of their prowess in you know paper making to create this whole body of work of uh, chronicling information data storage keeping he says this is the chinese civilization they analyze greatly he says you prefer your freedoms they prefer order they know uh, the value of freedom but they choose to prefer order over freedom i don't know you may agree you may not disagree but i am putting these these points to you look at some of the economic indicators there is no doubt that china today is the second largest economy the per capita chinese uh, the per capita income of uh, the chinese economy in per capita terms is 1/5 of usa he says by all reasonable assessments it, some time it will become half of the per capita uh, economy will become half of us that is reasonable half at the point at which it becomes half the chinese economy will exceed usa and eu put together e usa and eu put together two of the richest entities in the world look at china asia trade 1 trillion dollars what is eu america trade 905 billion dollars you see if any of these figures are true which i haven't seen any western source rebuff these shoes these figures the current problems in china may well be there but like that famous book you know it is the by somebody it says china the bubble that never pops many people have spelled china's dem- demise many times in the past it has not happened so he says instead of constantly predicting china's demise the west should see 
how it can smartly and cleverly readjust to a time when they are no longer number one. Now, is that the smart thing to do? This is something, by the way, which Bill Clinton also said in the 1990s. Then he stopped saying it because his ratings <laughs> began to go down. They were not popular. So we have to see China very realistically. Let me give you one other set of figures. I'm told after the, this is the rising Russia-China axis. By the way, you see the attendance in the Moscow Security Summit. If China and Moscow are isolated, will so many people be there? After the Ukraine conflict, I am told out of 170 nations in Africa, Latin America, West Asia, Indo-Pacific, only five sanctioned Russia. Get this figure right. The rest were either hedging or they were on the side of the Chinese or the, the Russians. So this whole American propaganda of the Chinese economy spluttering, I mean, it may be well happen. Because I gave you that whole Kani that side. One set of figures. This is the, the, the other set. Look at Yo, just two more minutes of Yo. So according to him, China accounts today for 35% of the global output. Look at technology. China leads in electricity vehicles by a huge way. Nobody is second to China, close second. Export of cars, they have beaten Japan. So I, I really don't know. The average Chinese has more bandwidth today than the average American, the average European, the average Singaporean and many others. Why? Because 3 million 5G base stations have been deployed across China, right up to the base camp of Mount Everest. And when you have bandwidth, innovation occurs, imagination flows, economies grow, nations prosper. Now, I don't know which of these two views are right. So we either depend, you know, uh, uh, believe you, or we believe that other set. The truth may be somewhere in between because as you go to that old adage that there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies and statistics. So you can spin data this way, you can spin data that way. But as Indians, what we should, I think we should, my conclusion so that you don't think I'm edging, is that we should take China seriously. It is a serious customer. It is on your border. There is... Uh, we should do, uh, let me tell you one thing, China is not 12 feet tall, I keep saying this. Should we do much of what we need to do, deterrence will force China to back off. If we don't do much that we should do, we may our weaknesses may invite China. So when people say, you know, budgets, this, that, carefully answer the question. Deterrence is costly, but wars are costlier. You don't believe me, ask the Ukrainians. So, you know, that that seems to be a nice, shall I say, summarized assessment on China. And thank you for asking the question, because if you hadn't asked the question, I wouldn't have spent time and time to, <laughs> trying to answer it. So both ways, you can't say for sure. There's a lot to worry about China. Xi is definitely a worried man, because now the time has come. He has to deliver on Taiwan. The economy is spluttering. Uske generals be wafa ho rahe hain. Or those spy wars. One more thing. You see, the Americans also, we must not write them off. The Americans are a little lazy. But when they wake up, there is no country which can take on the Americans. I was uh, reading somewhere. People have predicted American doom also. When Sputnik happened, they say, oh... Americans, you know, they are weak at mathematics. Look at the Soviet Union. During the missile crisis, they said Soviet Union has the edge. Then people said Japan. Then oh, suddenly uh, Osama bin Laden was more powerful than all of America put together. You know, all kinds of issues have happened. But America gets back. And two reasons why it gets, it gets back is because it's very smart with talent. It takes talent from around the world. Adverse demographics don't affect it. So our Satya Nidalas, 
our good people are sitting in America. They are working for America. They so that that whole talent ecosystem is very craftily designed. They get the best of talent, so they constantly innovate. And the second issue is that uh, that the capitalist system, the capitalist system disappoints. The American political system disappoints. I think it was Walter Mead who was saying our politicians are as bad as any in the world. But it is our people, this talent, this innovation. Capitalism disrupts. And when it disrupts, it puts you on your toes. Look at what the private sector is doing to shore up the American military. So, you know, if I have to put my final bet, an America that has woken up versus a rising aggressive China, the Americans will win. So my final bet is on the Americans. And therefore, I'm a big votary of the Indo-US defense relationship. And whatever came out of uh, the of Prime Minister Modi's visit to Washington, and I think we should closely, I wouldn't say partner, ally, because that becomes a very controversial issue, but leverage more intimately with whatever the Americans have to offer. Can I just ask you a small little question, sir? Short comment. Uh, militarily, uh, since we are talking about the time to deliver Taiwan has come, it's a military sort of a affair. Uh, how does China calculate the threat from India, sir? Because at the end of it today, when we see the writings, they are talking about a credible second front. They are talking about the fact that they are worried if they go into Taiwan, would the Indians do something at the back end? They are worried about the forces that they have to deploy on the Indian front. Uh, how do they kind of counterbalance that? Because the Taiwan front is not going to be a small front. It's going to be a huge, huge front with a massive amount of manpower which will be needed. How do they kind of envisage themselves doing this? And they, their own writings today in CICICR are talking about we can't leave India to chance of a neutrality. We can't leave it. We have to figure this out one way or the other. So what do you think is their perspective in that particular angle, sir? See, when I, if I were to sit in Beijing and uh, do statecraft on behalf of the Chinese with respect to India, the first thing I would tell them, if my head were not to be chopped off, <laughs> was is that with respect to India, you've been incredibly stupid. So let me say why. See, if I'm China and my battle is with the United States, who should be my natural ally? India. And what is India doing to you? border. We are saying we, we don't want to do anything. And here you are. In your arrogance, you disregard agreements from, you know, 1993 downwards. And in one brazen act, you come and do what you did in Galwar. Was it? Even if it was military heroism, in terms of statecraft, it is incredibly stupid. So you've got the th fifth largest economy the soon-to-be third largest economy with the world's largest volunteer army, you have you have created a two-front for yourself. Whom are you blaming? You have gone and done it. Just for the thrill of a couple of... Uh, I know what the thrill was. That whole military adventurism. In any case, it go, you got pushed back. So if you are to do Taiwan, it is incredibly stupid of, of you to go and do something in your rear. I'm sure Sun Tzu and uh, whoever, Confucius and all, must be turning in their graves. Ki ye kya ho gaya mere Chinese bhai? I mean, it is absolutely incredibly stupid. So I can't figure it out. So the only reason is that deep down, deep down the Chinese know that when it comes to the first point I made, it came to the, to the you know, to brutal geopolitics, the hardball of the international system. That truth is that there can be only one regional hegemon. The US knows it. The Chinese know it. There can be only one tiger on a hill. And the only tiger which threatens the Chinese hill is India. We can't help it. 
it's our size we are an equally old civilization so i think that peace will come in asia only when india successfully stands up to china either chinese show this wisdom which i spoke of they show no signs of showing it they are going and creating this second front and if they if this is the you know what shall i say the direction in which their start state craft is trending the only way is to see if territory were important to them in 62 they came down they came down uh, pretty deep and went back why so did they go back really territory is not the real issue it is this whole one tiger on a hill philosophy one tiger on a hill they can be own only one regional hegemon so even if india desires peace i don't think the chinese will grant it to us we will get our peace from strength so she has to know that this is an india which will stand up and um, if we stand up the chinese will back off as i said so yeah, we can see that happening today where they they're getting a bit frustrated with regards to how we are behaving with them so i guess that's that's something that i guess a taste of their own medicines i mean i mean yeah, I, as i said i seriously don't know why they did all this I, there is no logic at all military objectives i don't know sir what was the military objective or what was the political politico military objective both of them you've lost and then you say bhai this and that and the other and Just the, 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 the the second point is that there are a lot of naysayers within india oh china aake baith gaya ye kar raha hai wo kar raha hai i only asked them one question acha yaar theek hai chalo maan gaya wo baith gaya why isn't he celebrating it then his whole idea of coming to india was to tap us on the head and make us look down if he has so as to which i don't believe it done that he's met his objectives and why isn't he celebrating it see in any case with all this rebalancing and which all that has occurred lac we need not worry but uh, once again i'll be objective lac we need not worry but the larger chinese military juggernaut rocket force strategic support force digital yeah. combat that we have to be absolutely far more uh, you know uh, absolutely uh, 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 very off absolutely so this is what uh, see i have said this many times it's a cliche now chinese are biologically 5 feet tall by not doing what you should be doing you make them 10 feet tall mm. so if you do what you have to they are not 10 feet tall they are 5 Correct. feet tall. yeah yeah so simple simple baat ye hai absolutely i must congratulate you sir for for giving us a very very clean and clear analysis of course the chinese version was and that's just my opinion uh, the audience would differ was amusing to say it the least but there are certain credi- credible points to it as well it's not something that you can write off completely they still have a certain amount of strength and uh, a lot of the propagandists that talk about china will break up and this and that i don't buy that because there is a, there's a core innate strength within china of which is which still remains All they go to tell us that wisdom lies in assessing your adversary accurately it is foolish to absolutely. underestimate him absolutely no, he, he, he get, get an accurate measure he may go down the tube that's fine but that's not going to take away the chinese challenge for india and that's something that i think i have learned from your uh, talk today so thank you so what much we, always a pleasure sorry just make one small point what we must sir. do you see like the americans once they have woken up Mm-hmm. there is a book every week on china mm-hmm. there are six discussions on china from say you know the raw materials to technologies to innovation american think tanks do a war game on taiwan every week so look at the amount i am saying national security is an intellectually led exercise it is a misnomer that it is not you first have to get the intellect right and of course execution is equally important in india when china is our most intimate adversary why are we not doing enough of that we must do far more 
Hmm. So our think tanks must get energized. Our whole strategic commentariat should get more vibrant about China. China. And many of us could be wrong. I could be wrong. That's okay. You should have enough of uh, opinions and yes, sir. bandwidth hmm. of analysis so as to get the right uh, deductions about China. That unfortunately is not happening in the measure that it should. And I think that is something with channels like you are uh, doing a good job and we should scale Thank it up. So Thank you so much. Sir. Uh, my focus has always been predominantly China. I do dabble around with Pakistan and the stuff here and there. Uh, but Pakistan is a is, pest. It's a China pest and a it's pest. a nuisance. China is interesting also, sir, because one gets to learn a lot more about an adversary that you kind of considered not understandable because of the language. And today you realize, fair enough, language is a barrier, but it's not that big a barrier that you can't look through it. I mean, it's 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 as simple as that. And only once you start doing it, once you start reading about it, you kind of start piecing, pe making some sense of it. And as you said, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done with regards to China and the country. And I hope there is also a historical mystery. You know, I'm told from the year one to the year 1820, India and China were the world's leading civilizations and leading yep. economies. Yes. But in that period, there are two views now. Some people say that there was eternal peace. Some people said, no, it's false. We did clash with each other many did, times. Sir. But it was not as... Okay. So if we did, then this is history repeating itself. We shouldn't worry. <laughs> we should. We have, we have no option. If we did not, you know, come to blows in the past and 62 was an aberration, which is the view of many Indian scholars, uh, then we have to wonder why post-47, post-49, we have got into this confrontational poise with China. If year 1, 2, 1820 were peaceful, which means that two nations could, you know, and what is really worrying in geostrategic terms, for the first time in history, you have the world's number one and three economies in PPP terms growing together. And now there are no Himalayas to separate you. The natural barrier has been breached by technology. So confrontation is... So, you know, there are these large questions which have to be answered on China. There is the nitty gritty which has to be resourced with respect to China. So from platoon to grand strategy, there is so much that we need to do in, with, with regard to... Uh, to, to China uh, so that you know and uh, you know peace comes from strength as Swami Vivekanand says he says the world is a gymnasium where <laughs> nations come to make themselves strong so mm -hmm. this is the one specter of that larger gymnasium the Sino-Indian theatre interesting absolutely sir there, I don't think there is there's, there's going to be any disagreement to that and it's it's for us, actually, as the as the generation coming in and as the next generation comes in from even my age, I would rather presume that they will be more educated about China just by the factor that the amount of conversations people have today at at the non-political, at the non-military level. I don't know what happens in that entire domain. <clears throat> but, you know, YouTube and this and that has become... Initially, when I used to do shows on China, so people are not interested to watch it. Today, the interest levels are much higher because people have begun to understand a little bit as to what's actually happening. And I call myself the 1% China man, sir, because that's all I understand of China. But I try my best to learn more. You know, I want to uh, tell you something which the external affairs minister has said. He says, you know, national security and diplomacy needs to be democratized. Yep. It needs to be taken to the street. Because sometimes the street responses to these issues Much better. are far more smarter than the decisions which are taken in the corridors of power. So I'm very glad this is happening. Now it must go into you know regional channels also. And listen, China is such a fascinating subject. National mm -hmm. security is so exciting. Everybody will be drawn. Absolutely. It is, it, it, it is natural human curiosity. Only we have not we have made it this very, you know, hush-hush, big thing. 
there are of course certain aspects which cannot be discussed in the public domain. Yeah, the larger issues, China should interest everybody. We should have far more views than China. And they must go to these regional challenges, chat channels in the Tamil, Marathi, Rajasthani. It has to become more of a commoner piece. Absolutely. The national security has suffered from too much of elitism. It needs to be mm. democratized. Absolutely, sir. I mean, the people like me try my best, sir. And I hope that I see you back again on a... We, we should plan a podcast, sir. We should plan a nice long podcast on a weekend where we take in some audience also and have some fun. I get, uh, you know, decent amount of audience for China as well. So exactly. we should be able to plan that out and actually have some fun yeah. with it because uh, this thing. I'll, I'll connect with you, sir. Till that time, Jai Hind and Jai Bharat. Thank you, Adi. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Pleasure is mine, sir.